very happy with with the images that you've sent. Um, I'm very happy that you're taking serious the assignments. Some of you have time, you don't have time. But besides all, all the knowledge or all the comments and the feedback that I'm giving you, uh, what I truly believe that makes a difference is that you start working on, on your own uh, weak weaknesses. I think that's what makes um, the strength of this course and what I can provide. As I said the other day, I'm just placing a mirror in front of your faces. So pretty much things that maybe you're not aware and bring them back to you again in your own photo styles or your own mistakes or whatever you can work. And I think that's the key. And also that's, that's the same way uh, that I've been learning um, myself. So answering your question you asked before has been quite a busy uh, week for me. I read the book called The 5 a.m. Club, uh, which I knew about. So I'm waking up every day at five o'clock in the morning. So by, uh, by noon, I had already exercised, worked, and, and cooked almost. So uh, I suggest that if you don't do that, wake up very early in the morning because it's working for me and for my my personal mood too. Okay, so what we have for, for today, I'm going to be focusing on, on portraits, right? Uh, some of you, you have sent me very interesting uh, images. Uh, of course, I have to randomly choose because there's no time for everything. So I kind of pick and choose things that I think they fit into, into the class. So today, basically, is portraits uh, this is Pilar, uh, my daughter, she's taking Chinese classes. Um, and this is one of the things that we're going to be talking about, uh, the, uh, the depth of field and the aperture. Obviously, it's a very simple snapshot. Uh, but as I've been, been telling you these days, when you take images with the phone, you have to start crafting them in the same way you will craft them or make them or put them together with your big camera. Uh, that's why some of the things that I've been reinforcing, they have to do with photography in general and not so much about the phone because in reality is the same. And I have pick and choose images from all of you. So uh, Alex sent me this, this photograph uh, as an example of an image that she took uh, uh, locking on the subject taken at night and then overexposing. If this photograph had been taken without making that adjustment, uh, like Patricia sent me other photographs, it will have been completely pretty much a dark subject. Very simple reason, there's a bright light and only a very dim light coming from a red uh, source or pink source on the left. So I'm glad that you guys are starting to incorporate these ideas and once they become second nature, you'll see that everything will be much more smooth and things uh, it will work better. So what I want to talk about today, um, as I said, it's about uh, portraits. And in order to talk about portraits, I want to bring out uh, something that seems to be very simple, but I think the understanding and the approach of people to lenses has an impact in the way they photograph. And let me, let me see if I can put this through. So we have different type of lenses. I'm sure this is known by all of you. Uh, the iPhone or the different phones, they allow us different angles or perspectives that we can capture, right? So a telephoto lens, who can explain me what a telephoto lens is? Uh, super simple, who, wanted, who can tell me what it's a telephoto? I'm sorry, you know, <laughs> no? Zoom, no. it's a zoom lens. Hello, Hub. So, Hello. so actually, actually, Patricia is not. Mm. Uh, and that's a, a very interesting response uh, mm -hmm. because uh, Zoom is the ability of a particular lens to change and bring yeah. things, to change the, uh, uh, the, the field of view. That's what a Zoom is making, right? But you can have a Zoom that it's a telephoto lens and you can have a zoom that it's a wide angle lens. So basically a telephoto lens is, is the equivalent of bringing something, a subject that is very far in the distance, closer to us. That's a telephoto lens. It's like a, like a telescope that allows us to see the stars. Um, so uh, 
Patricia, many, that answer is given by many people, but also you can buy a Zoom lens that goes all the way from, from super, super wide into a, into a, a regular um, angle of view, okay? So basically a telephoto is something that it, uh, brings me something is into the, that is in the distance close to my subject. What examples do we see? When we see uh, sports photographs, right? Somebody's photographing a tiny bird that is on top of a branch, I'm using a telephoto lens. Uh, paparazzi images of celebrities. Uh, all these things are photographed with a telephoto lens and there's many different, of tele, many different telephoto lens, lenses. What is a normal lens? And after this brief explanation, I think you'll understand why I'm putting everything into context. A normal lens is nothing else like what we can see with your own eyes. So I would say that pretty much a normal lens is something like this. I don't know exactly to describe that angle. Is what I can see in front of me without the distortion that I can see on the side. That would be a normal lens. The equivalent to a normal lens in photography, normally that's a 50 millimeter lens. So when you buy a 50, that's a normal lens. And a wide angle lens is something or a lens that allows me to capture a wider scene. So I have tele, I have normal, and I have wide angle lens. So let me ask you a quick question. Uh, when would I use each of them? I just want quick, quick, quick answers. And what is the impact that they have on my photography? Uh, Susan. Yes. How are you doing today? You mentioned doing, you, you, had, you had a tough day or a long day or a I, tough I've week. I've been busier than normal. <laughs> okay. Well, I hope it's, it's nothing negative. No, no, I'm starting to get back into a normal kind of thing. So I've okay. been busier. So um, what did you want me to answer? No. So I want to answer, how would you describe a telephoto lens? If you take a photo with a telephoto lens, what is the impact on your subject? How, what kind of look are you getting when you photograph with a telephoto lens? You get to photograph something that's farther away um, yes. so that it looks closer, a bit bigger. Yes. Okay. So that's the common answer. Okay. Yeah. That's what everybody thinks that is doing. But there's other things that the telephoto lens is doing for us that they're the really important ones. Okay. So before I answer, uh, a normal lens, a uh, hub. Uh, how does a, a photograph taken with a normal lens look like? Well, it doesn't, <clears throat> it doesn't provide uh, so much distortion. A telephoto would change the depth of field a lot. Um, something that's close up, you can, uh, especially that's a 50, you don't have uh, so much facial distortion. You can probably use lighting a little bit more uh, precisely. Yes. Uh, uh, I don't know. I don't use one of the. I don't use a fifty very much. What else? Okay, okay, but it's good. It's good. Okay. What about a wide angle lens, Dirk? Uh, how does a photograph taken with a wide wide angle lens look like? Can you describe it? Well, it's. Uh, I would say it's a little. Well, it's a little bit curved usually because it takes in a, a, the sides, the wider sides of the of the normal eye view. It's like if, as if you had I don't know frog eyes or something like that. Like not you not you go a little bit out of your uh, out of your normal uh, view angle, and therefore I think typically it's a little bit curved in, and uh, it allows you yeah to get uh, I don't know I, maybe you could compare it I'm not sure technically it's probably not right it's a little bit comparable with a panorama picture, without having okay. to move to ha without having to move to get everything in. Okay, okay, so you have a wider angle of view. But let me continue and then you're gonna, hopefully you're gonna take down, you're gonna take note of these two things that I'm gonna tell you because it's gonna change your photography forever, okay? But uh, uh, before I tell you the difference, let's, let's continue. Uh, when you're taking portraits, right, you have to think about the lens choice. This is really important and why does it matter? Because uh, Susan was telling us that a, a long lens, a telephoto lens, is basically bringing me something that is in this distance closer to us. That is true, but the real impact on using a telephoto lens on our photographs is another one. Layers, they look compressed. They look that they've been stuck much closer. And Dirk, mm. 
a wide angle lens is actually using the opposite. Hello, Janet. It's the first time I'm seeing you. Like this is going up and down. I didn't realize. Her. Hi. So a wide a wide angle lens is actually giving me the opposite. It's giving me the sensation not only that is a wider scene that I can capture, like the panorama that Dirk was describing, but it also there's more space between the layers, right? So mm. if I get hired to photograph a birthday party and that party, it's empty and there's nobody in the room and I photograph with a wide angle lens, what is gonna happen is that my viewer is gonna get the feeling that the restaurant is empty because there's lots of spaces in between. Nobody talks about this and this is the key. It's not so much about it that it's like this, it's, it's that I have more space visually in between. So if I wanna fool my client, and I want to give a look that my party or my restaurant is completely full. What I do is I choose the right, the right perspective. I place myself where I have customers with a telephoto lens. And that's how I fool the viewer to think that the restaurant is full. So this is the real use of telephoto and wide angle beyond the fact that is bringing me things closer or further away. Okay and also has to do with other things that we will be mentioning but i hope this is making sense so the first thing i have two screens i have a big screen behind and then the computers i don't really know where to look because you're everywhere and i, I see my eyes are pointing the wrong direction but uh perspective so perspective you know how the feeling that we get as a viewer from what we've been photographing i just mentioned the space between our layers so why do i need to care if somebody like Hub is photographing one of those beautiful birds, right, and she photographs with a wide angle lens, she needs to come very, very close to those birds for the viewer to have a feeling that there's an interesting subject matter in the mm -hmm. foreground. And then she has to play with all the layers behind. If she brings me closer to that bird with a telephoto or a normal lens, I don't get that sense of space. I don't get that sense of perspective, but everything looks that is stuck closer to each other. So I can fool. And also it has to do with the distance. So remember, you can always get, uh, walk closer to your subjects or in many occasions. So if you're using a phone, I would say do not use the telephoto lens because uh, I'll explain you later, it's better that you walk closer and use the wide angle lens if you want sharper photographs, okay? Simple stuff. And the best zoom out there is your feet. You walk towards your subject, you go back. That's how it works. That's how you will be more successful. When I buy this gadget, they tell me, oh, you have a super digital zoom that I, I can see the neighbor all the way up in the mountains. It doesn't matter. If I wanna get a good shot, I have to walk all the way to my neighbor and take the shot. That's my advice when it comes to people and when it comes to photographs. And I think it was Hub that was mentioning proportions and also Dirk. So that is true. Yep. A normal lens has no distortion. A telephoto lens has no distortion. And normally wider lenses, they tend to be uh, a little bit distorted. That is not fully true because the very, very expensive wide angle lens, they're rectilinear, so they, they remove that distortion. So if you buy a lens that is $3,000 or $4,000 or $5,000, normally it's rectilinear, but still the edges, they tend to see that distortion. So an interesting fact, fact I have, the 50 and the 35 are two of my favorite lenses to photographing people. Mm. So keep, keep that in mind, you mentioned you're not very keen on 50, if you buy a 50 1.4, super inexpensive lens, amazing for portraits. For three, 300 bucks to 50, you can get a 50 1.8. For 100 extra bucks, you get a 1.4. And you already have super portraits. Amazing tool, and you need, don't need to go to a $2,000 lens if you don't want to. So everybody is, is with me? Yeah? Yes? Okay. What, what was that 50 yeah. lens and 130 lens? What is the difference? Is that your question, Dirk? No, no, the ones that you like, the ones that you prefer, the 50 oh, oh, and which one? Oh, no, a 50 and a 35. I love it. Oh. Uh, and when I used to do most of my assignments for the New York Times, they were produced with a 50 and a 24 fixed lenses all the time, like the whole thing. 
Uh, of course, if I'm shooting wildlife, I need a telephoto lens, but still I would shoot with a, a short lens and manage my way to tell a story with, with fixed lenses. Uh, what I, I can tell you that I do is to photograph with 1.4 lenses, and this phone has 1.4 lens. So that's fantastic. So angles of vision, so depending on the lens that we're photographing, this is the amount of space that we're, that we're photographing out there. So if we were in Venice looking at a, from a bridge into the, one of the channels, this is what I get. If it's a 50, it's the yellow uh, rectangle. The outer layer is the 28, 35 is also rectilinear. And I zoom in and I zoom out. So keep these things in, in your mind. And remember what I said at the beginning, not only think of terms and bringing something further close, how it's gonna impact my photographs in terms of perspective and in terms of distance between my subject and the background, okay? And I, I, uh, Dirk sent me an email or a WhatsApp and he asked me, I want you to talk about these photographs that I sent the other day and which one do you like better? And I, I chose it because it's directly connected with what we're discussing. So this is what he, what he sent to the class. I noticed that he's, for example, cropping images in very strange dimensions. Uh, <laughs> and you're all, you're all doing that. And that's not a good idea. And I'm going to tell you why. Uh, if in the future you want to do a, a family book a publication, an article in a magazine, if you start cropping in very weird dimensions, you're going to put the, the, the art designer in a complex situation because they may love the photograph, but the page does not have that format. So my suggestion is if you're going to crop your images, always make it proportional to the original, three by four, four by five, whatever you shot. That's what I would do. So this is, this is the image that he sent to the class that I thought it was fantastic. And this is the original one before being cropped. And he said, Kike, can you comment which one is better, the wider or the closer? So he got me thinking on, on that one because I know he's trying to push the boundaries to get out of zooming in so much to provide wider storytelling. That's my feeling from his question. And he got me thinking. So this is what I have to tell you, Dirk, and the rest of the class. Um, you have to ask yourself, and I'm not going to answer these questions, but this is, this is the, uh, the quiz you need to ask yourself. Is this a single photograph, or does it belong to a story? It's not the same that your daughter's picture is going to be published or used by itself, or it's going to be part of another story, right? or, or a story with more images. It makes a big difference. Who is your audience, right? Uh, this may sound silly, but it's not. Because if people that are gonna be looking at these photographs, they're interesting, interested in architecture and indoor spaces, they care about the distribution of the furniture. If they care about uh, children activities during the quarantine, they care about your daughter and the girl and not the space. So the selection is connected to that. What is the main message? The same thing again. It's about a girl or a daughter doing her homework or reading, or it's about a dad coping with the quarantine or distribution of furniture or whatever that is. It's not the same. What and whom is my main subject? Same question, different idea. It's about your daughter or it's about the space? Who is the main subject? The space? or this, the, the subject that happens to be your daughter. Another way of saying the same thing again, is your project or your photograph about your own feelings and your desire to express a message, or is about documenting the situation as it is? If your priority is feelings, you can crop things, you can modify, you can even fool me. If it's about documenting, it has to be more descriptive, okay? So I don't know if I answer your question with these questions, but I got you thinking here. <laughs> so Alex, who is sitting next to you? That is, I can, I can see the image on the side. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Uh, okay, and where will the photo be used? As I said before, is it gonna be used in a furniture magazine? Is it gonna be an, an archi architectural magazine about the use of space? It's about, about uh, school uh, being done at home. So 
with all the questions that I, that I ask you, look at both photographs and it's for you to decide which one is better because I don't have a final answer. I know sometimes many of you, they want me to tell you the accurate answer in photography and in art. Uh, and I think in education in general, there's no one answer. It depends on what you think, how you feel, and what is your purpose. I can help you in your thinking process. Uh, so hopefully with these ideas and answering that, that question. And that same thing applies to this photograph. He asked me, which one is it better? The one that I cropped with this weird crop that he did that looked more artistic or the one on the left that I can see the shower, the swimsuit and the toys. Those questions that I shared before, they apply on this photograph too. If this image is more artistic in a way, maybe the one on the right because it was great for the assignment. If you ask me which one do I prefer, is the one on the left because it shows me the space, there's a story behind. I put her into context, the distribution of the, of the, of the pool. Uh, it fits into your story. So I hope I'm, I'm giving you hints on see these distinctions. And again, be careful with unusual cropping because it's not such a good idea at times. So interesting thing about the, um, uh, the iPhone or the, or the new phones is that this one has two lenses uh, I think Alex has three. You have the pro, right? I think you said. Um, yeah. So basically what, what I described, like wide angle lens, normal and telephoto is contained within one phone. So that's pretty cool. A wide angle and a telephoto at the same time. So basically, and I'm sure you guys know this, but uh, when I put myself into the photo, you know, um, I can just click and by clicking into Zoom, it's transi transitioning between 0.5 and 1x. That's basically moving from wide angle uh, to a telephoto lens or normal. But something that people are not, not aware is that if you press on that, uh, on that 0.5x and you hold it, you get a wheel like that one. Oh, hold on one sec. Uh... And then you can, you can move that wheel and I pretty much can transition from any from any lens length uh, based on whatever I bought. So if my phone has a telephoto lens and a wide angle lens, I press and I can move back and forth between both systems. So it opens basically a sliding zoom and it lets me adjust. My overall advice uh, and my honest advice, because something that I will always be, I will always be very uh, uh, honest with you and my students and whoever I'm trying to encourage and help because I think I'm doing a favor being honest across uh, the process is don't zoom too much, right? Don't fool yourself because you have a particular phone that you can use the telephoto lens to do whatever you can use the digital zoom. Don't do it. Walk closer to your subject and your photographs will be much better. This has to be to do with shutter speed and other things, but just believe me, walk closer to your subject. Um, an interesting thing that people ask me is what happens, right, when I'm not shooting very wide or I'm shooting normal? So basically what the iPhone or the Galaxy or the other phones are doing, they're blending images. So basically they're getting the best thing from the wide and the best thing from the photo, from the uh, telephoto. And this is called by Apple Fusion. So it's two images that the computer is mixing into one. So whenever you do that sliding zoom that I described and you position yourself in the center, you're combining the wide angle lens image with its features and good characteristics and the tele and, and merging them into what is called fusion, okay? So um, let me see what I have. So some things for you to remember. Uh, wide angle lens is fantastic for obviously capture more sense of the space, but also it's better to shoot in low light, right? Uh, I'm not gonna get into why, but believe me on this, we can answer the next day if you don't understand why. But if I'm gonna be photographing in a room, in a birthday party, whatever that is, I have to photograph why. If you zoom, your images are gonna be more grainier, they're not gonna be as sharp. And the idea is to have sharp photographs with good quality. And also allows me 
to photograph with a wider aperture normally. So when you combine a wider aperture with low light and a shorter lens, it's a fantastic combination to get better photographs. And the telephoto lens has less distortion. So if I'm going to be photographing Alex or Hub or Susan and I get my phone just in front of their faces over there, I'm going to distort their noses, their ears, their hair, their neck because it's going to happen because there's distortion because in order to have more angle and it has to have uh, different features so don't do it and also it needs more available light so in low light if i'm going to be photographing a rainforest you're not going to see me use a telephoto lens on my phone you're going to be shooting ambience the ecosystem the space that's what i'm going to be doing why would i fool myself trying to photograph the slot on the top of, of, of the tree when I'm not going to be successful. So I think that's one of the biggest uh, teachings in photography that I can, I can teach you. Be aware of what you cannot do. And instead of wasting your time, put your efforts into what is possible. And then, boom, quantitative change. And also remember that the iPhones have no stabilization from what I know. So when you photograph with a Sony in a forest in low light, you should, and things they look sharp because they've been compensated by the lens. It doesn't happen with the iPhone. So that's why the other day on chapter one, that hopefully everybody has seen by now, I mentioned grab your phone, make it stable, hold your arm clo uh, elbows closed because it's everything interconnected. I know at the beginning it sounds like a very awkward advice to lock your elbows and do those things, but it does have an impact in your photographs and a big, um, and a big impact. Uh, so some tips for portrait photography, and I'm sorry that I'm giving this uh, speech nonstop, but I want to maximize time with, with this topic, is uh, always avoid sun sunlight. As I said the other day, uh, don't fool yourself with what you read or what they tell you. On a sunny day, don't walk at noon to photograph in the middle of the street because you're making a big mistake. You think colors are more saturated. They're not. Under the porch, they tend to be better. Be aware of the background, super, super important. The color matters, but not the color of your subject, the color of the background. So if Patricia has a red dress and she's in, a, in front of a green wall, it has an impact. And she has a red dress in front of a red wall, that color matters, okay? Very, very important uh, color combination, even if it's blurry. Right? So if, if Patricia is standing in a restaurant and the back wall is red, it has an impact in the photograph. And if it's yellow or green, it has it changes the mood. Remember what we were referring the other day as color. Ah, and this is very important, the distance to the background. This is the other thing, Susan, that you need to remember when using telephoto lens. In order to get your photographs, a sensation of blurriness, separation between your subject and the background, right? Is not only the lens and it's not only the phone, is the distance between your subject and the background. So if I'm photographing an albatross and that albatross is 20 centimeters from a rock, no matter what I do, both of them, they're gonna be in focus. But if the albatross is three feet away, I can create a separation. And if I use a wide angle lens, I can even create more separation. And if I photograph with a telephoto lens, I'm stacking everything together. So that's why all these ideas, when you put them into context, they make a difference. These are uh, images sent uh, by Alex. She was telling me that this is, these are photographs that she took the other day, and now she would do them differently. Is that correct, Alex? Yep. Do you mind commenting on them really quickly while I while I, I, I go through them and connect with some of the ideas that I just said, please. Yeah, this was using the um, technique of, you know, uh, pre-focusing. So I had said, I was trying to take uh, photos of a large party setup and then somebody came into the frame to set up the table. Um, it was really, really dark lighting. So I think now kind of knowing I would have tap focused somewhere else for the brightness. Um, because there's light in the back and on the table, reflection off the glass and stuff. But um, yeah, in hindsight, I could have pre-focused this a little bit better. It's not a horrible shot, but I definitely think I can, I can practice on it. 
Um, Good observation. And I love all the pictures that you sent me in terms of reflecting on your own images. Uh, something that I, I want to point out. Remember, I've been, uh, we were fo focusing on color yes, the other day, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the quality of the light and the temperature of the light has an impact in color, right? So if I'm in a kitchen and they have like tungsten lights, everything is blue. If I'm in the desert in the Sahara at noon, everything is red. And it's not red because the light is like, is there's temperature, but that temperature is creating feelings. So if, if uh, Alex wants to give us a feeling of a cozy place, it has to go towards the red. If he wants to give us a feeling of uh, fresh, it has to go towards the blue. So mm -hmm. this is very important. The other question that I have for all of you, do we really need so much space in the foreground or we don't? Probably not because what information is providing me? Well, now with social distancing that you go to that place and you have <laughs> space to sit down. But uh, besides that, uh, maximize uh, your images. This is another one she sent. Uh, uh, what about this one, Alex? Why do you send this one? So that one, um, I was taking this in the middle of a dinner rush. So there was a lot of action, people moving really quickly, uh, food coming in, in the window really fast and being taken out fast. But I wanted to capture, you know, the movement. And in this one, there's no focus on anything. Um, it's very mildly on the ticket line, but I would have liked to have the focus be on the food for this and then the motion of the people working in the kitchen. So, you know, in the next time around, again, really low lighting um, and with motion, it was a little difficult, but I would have tried to make sure to tap focus on the food. Absolutely. Uh, and actually this is, uh, I'm gonna answer, Janet, you're still with us, right? Because I, you yes. keep on moving up and down. Okay, Janet, Janet was asking, was telling me or asking me that she was having a trouble locking the focus. So I don't know your phone by yes. heart, uh, uh, Janet, bad, but, yeah, bad, bad. but, but no, normally how you focus is you hold. The other day I was describing that before taking the photograph, you just click a little bit, you get that yellow square. So if you hold it, you're actually locking it. So if Alex wants to lock the focus on that pizza with her finger, not only touches the screen pointing that pizza, but she holds it. And then on the upper portion of the screen, I get AEAF and it's locking. And then I can change that brightness up and down. If you don't do that, what is happening when you move is gonna go crazy. The first shot, it will work, but then the phone is gonna readjust and it's gonna choose somewhere else. So that's how you do it. And I'm positive if my I memory- I is Yay, I see it. <laughs> Okay, okay. I'm, I'm glad to hear, Janet. So, so that's how it works. Uh, very quickly, these images from Alex, same concept uh, on this one. Why, why this one, Alex? What's, what's, why do you submit this one? Same thing, but also I don't like how tight of the shot is. I think I could have moved back a little bit more so you could have seen in this one, um, you know, the people in front of the oven and the guy behind him, you can barely tell, but he's holding like the peel to throw a pizza in the oven. There's just a lot more in this scene that could have been shown. And again, the focus is just not there. Absolutely. And two, uh, two things that I want to, to point out. Alex sees the world vertical. All her world is vertical. All the images, it doesn't matter that it's flowers, food, <laughs> a boyfriend, it's always vertical, 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 okay? No, there's both options and you want to combine. Yes. Same thing with, with when you work with, with regular cameras, everything is horizontal. No, it's vertical and horizontal. That's number one, Alex, sorry that I point that out. Number oh, two, <laughs> something that really bothers me, right? Color. What color is present in that photograph that is calling the attention more than anything else? Whatever blue thing is on the background is directly bringing the attention to me. All yeah. the colors are green, uh, brown, uh, whatever colors are present in that kitchen. And I have a blue thing that is the color of Hub's uh, uh, beautiful <laughs> shirt. So it doesn't, it, it doesn't work, okay? You see small, de small details. They don't make a difference. Same thing with this one. We're gonna move along. I love the moment. Uh, I don't think it's correctly cropped or framed, I would say. Um, and it's probably this is not a vertical image. Probably this is a horizontal image. Show me the full pizza closer to the uh, surface and the, the interaction. So keep, keep these things in mind. So 
Let me move uh, forward quickly because as a Spaniard, it's very hard for me not to talk, but on the other hand, I want you guys to, uh, to learn as much as, as we potentially can. So uh, Alex was saying the other day, she was exploring uh, light modes. I'm not gonna uh, fully talk about them. I'm gonna describe them and that will be your exercise for the following day. So natural light obviously is natural light. There's nothing for me to tell you. What is studio light when you choose this? Studio light, basically, it's a well-lit face and a darker background. So it's the equivalent of being in a studio and placing a spotlight or a floodlight into somebody's face. So that's going to be lit. And then the rest is darker. Then I have uh, what is called contour light. Contour light is giving me a three-dimensional look. Um, and it's basically what it's doing, giving stronger shadows in the face. As uh, I think Alice was saying the other day that she was experimenting, I think it was the boyfriend's hands uh, mm -hmm. from the uh, senator perspective. Um, you have to experiment with this because uh, some people like it, they don't like it. Bright face, dark background, that's what you get in stage light. So it's the equivalent. I go and photograph Mark Anthony on stage. There's lots of lights pointing to the guy. The overall is dark, but he's, he's uh, bright. So very similar to studio light. And I'm not going to talk about this because I will run out of time. The, uh, quote of the day or the two quotes of the day, there is one thing the photograph must contain, and that's the humanity of the moment. If you are able to um, incorporate this quote by Robert Frank into your photography, your images will become timeless. I think that's what, what we all strive for and we crave when we produce work. Uh, not only that our friends and family say, oh, this is beautiful, or they give a like on Instagram, even though they don't believe it, but if we can connect with that humanity, not only on, on, on the photograph level, but also on your viewers, if they can connect with your world and with the way you see things, then your work becomes very important and very different. And then this one, a portrait is not made in the camera, but on either side of it. Very true. I have a full presentation about portraits and how people react to being rejected and all these things. The photograph or the portrait is not myself capturing an indigenous kid in the jungle. It's the kid allowing me to capture his essence, his moment, and his life. And only when both things are merged together, there's a portrait that happens. That's why, in my opinion, People photography does not happen with a telephoto lens because one of the parts is not aware, okay? So this was by Edward State Station. So let's look at some images. These are images of mine as, as, as I normally do. Uh, it doesn't matter that you like them, you dislike them, if I do like them. It's just to show you things that I think they're relevant to what we're discussing in the class. So this was taken in my last uh, trip to Carnival right and this was a, a beautiful girl before before the the parade how did i put this photograph together well this was when you photograph carnival you have the worst uh, light possible it's the middle of the day and it's horrible shadows everybody's in the wrong place so i noticed these dancers that were getting ready and one of them was sitting on the floor covering herself because uh, to avoid being burned with a flag. This is the flag from Barranquilla, a city in Colombia. So what I did is I said, would you mind uh, posing for me for a second and putting the flag on top of your face or head so you have like an even light? So by doing so, I achieved two things. Very soft light and automatically any person that is familiar with Barranquilla knows that this is taken in Barranquilla. So an image acquires a different level by a sim very simple action. Grabbing a blanket, a curtain, whatever it is, and placing a color. You don't see the rest, you don't see her hands. And this I photograph with a telephoto lens, because if I shot with a wide angle lens, you see her hands that is holding the flag in order to produce this, okay? So I'm unveiling some of my tricks here. I hope you keep them for yourself and you don't start posting uh, everywhere. No, I'm just kidding, but I uh, hope it's useful. This is another image from Carnival uh, taken a few <laughs> weeks ago. Uh, uh, telephoto lens, right? 
this is key, but also the fulfilled. Two images here with the same technique. This one that obviously has a very high shutter speed so I can freeze action. Actually, I have a book that is about to uh, be published that is connected with a similar tradition to this. Uh, this is very difficult to photograph and very dangerous. And I discovered, right, that something I didn't understand. There was always a guy with a flag walking around. And I photographed this carnival many times. And this year, something striking in my head. Now I understand why they carry a flag. Because they're telling the direction of the wind. So in order to, for this to be safe, they walk up front. And depending how the wind is blowing, they do the performance or they blow the fire or not. So by paying attention to your surroundings, like uh, Patricia noticed so many details around as a good photographer, that's what you have to do. Not only understand the, uh, the anthropological aspect of the celebration, but the technical logistic in order to capture this moment. Because otherwise, it's impossible. And many travelers, they come with me and they try to photograph this. It's very, very hard, like extremely hard. Even for me, it's so this photograph and then this photograph, almost the same image, but I have completely changed the, uh, the perception of, of yourself. The first one, I have included a photographer. I have included an audience. So this photograph, Dirk, like the question you asked me before, uh, is not better or worse, is connected with who is the audience. Is this about uh, photographers at risk, capturing the moment, placing yourself, navigating a parade versus the other one it's a marketing image this one is more a storytelling and documentary image of photographers capturing uh, things like this another photograph taken with the iphone many times when i'm photographing i have my long lens or whatever camera and then i come closer to my subjects i take a couple of quick shots and then i move on and i start switching so the phone becomes a real tool and that's why i really care about this course and that's why i took it so seriously preparing all the materials because i know your photographs they're going to become much better when we finish because they already are even though you don't realize and you you'll see uh this one similar technique this is a different girl under the sun she was covering with a piece of uh, uh whatever material from the uh from the carriage so that's what I did. I pretty much crawled down and that's how I photographed. If I had done on the outside, no success will, will have been achieved. Same thing with uh, this image. Very shallow depth of field. Why it works? Because the eyes of the subject on the left can be seen through the mask. There's eye contact. So when you start looking at the image, you see. But same mistake that Alex did. You see the green from the police, the orange from the Red Cross. Uh, but I couldn't do anything, but at least I'm aware and I can modify it. These are uh, some iPhone shots uh, that I've taken using the techniques that I have described. That's, uh, that's Cuba. This is uh, in Chile. Uh, that's, uh, those are, these are all quick portraits, but you see they, they have something to them beyond being a snapshot. A portrait of a journalist uh, uh, that came with us to Colombia and now uh, covering all that is happening in Atlanta with the protests. Um, another photograph of my daughter in Halloween, the same thing, playing with the aperture, making sure that the background complements her, the outfits, the face, the expression. It's not a snapshot, it's a real photograph, but it's taken with, a, with an iPhone, okay? Keep that in mind. This is in Camars. These are the guardians in, uh, in Southern France, same thing. Uh, Susan, if I photograph this with a telephoto lens, it's impossible to uh, isolate my subject from the background. Why? Very simple, because the subject is very close to the background. If I have to ask him to stand further away, or I have to fool the viewer in a different way, because otherwise both things are in focus when there's pretty much no distance. Uh, this is a healer in Colombia, also for a project that I'm working on in border with uh, Venezuela. Uh, and an image from our trip in, uh, in China, horizontal uh, to show Alex that there's life beyond vertical and it <laughs> works and it can work. Uh, and again, this is just a family snapshot, but a family snapshot can be beautiful, can be well composed. I can play with brightness, sharpness, all those elements, they become into play. So today I wanna learn about 
I want you to learn about a photographer called uh, Christopher Anderson. I don't know if you know the guy. Uh, he's a Magnum photographer. He became famous or known in, I think it was 1999 because he covered, he jumped into a wooden uh, uh, boat crossing from Haiti to the US and he sank. So he won an award for that project and that's how he became world famous um, and many other things. And you can write down the name and do some research, but let's look at some of his emotive portraits. And that's why I chose him. So interesting thing about photography or, or fascinating is that we all photograph different. Um, different styles are, are, are pro, appeal different people and I think that's magnificent. And that's mm -hmm. why I love photography so much. So look how he's, he's photographing, how he's choosing the compositions, uh, the direction of the light. I can see the texture of the plane, the light of the windows. Pretty much how many times have you been on, on, a, on a plane, sitting down and seeing the person up front and you notice something. So that's what he's transmitting, okay? Just with a, with a photograph. Uh, what Hub was telling to do, trying to do the other day and she was having trouble uh, photographing. I think I didn't show that photo by mistake, but <clears throat> by selecting the focus, I can make sure it's on the shadow, it's on the person, it's on the glass, it's on the background, and I can bring all those colors into play. Same thing here, I'm playing with, uh, with a more artistic approach. The light uh, that is coming into the room or a window perfectly plays overlapping the eye, half of the face. This is not random, right? This person didn't say, oh, I'm going to start shooting with my iPhone and I'm going to go crazy. This person Question. studied it. Are these iPhone photographs or not? No, 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 no. No, Listen, no, the, no. The, the, the ones from the other day from, uh, uh, from the New York Times, those were iPhone photos. These ones, I don't yeah. know. I assume yeah. they're not. They could perfectly be. Uh, but I don't know. I'm not going to lie to you. I just chose them because yeah, they're I beautiful the portraits. Yeah, yeah, but they can be taken with an iPhone. I can, I, I can tell you. Like, like we saw, um, um, Kathy, uh, what was the person? Yeah, they, well, I, I forgot. But the, the work that I saw you from Kathy Ryan the other day, all that was, uh, was, was uh, an uh, iPhone work. So you see, same technique, waiting for the light going through the eye, uh, highlights and low lights, the lips. Uh, this, the expression, the color, the temperature of the image, everything comes into play to fool your imagination, your opinion, whatever that is, the message. So it all, it all depends. And another portrait, this is not a, an iPhone shot for sure. These are, these are like camera. Um, so one, one quick video that hopefully is gonna have uh, sound. If it doesn't have sound, I, I will reconnect again. I hope I didn't make that mistake again. But uh, let's, let's see a little bit about uh, uh, disrupting uh, the portrait. Do you have sound? Not yet. Can you hear? No. No. Ay, ay, ay. Okay. I'm sorry about that. It's, it's whenever I do this, I have to press something in the lower corner. And if I don't, there's no sound. Um, sorry about that. So we're back again and hopefully this time is done. I have photographed migrants to presidents to my family. I'm always approaching the image with the same set of tools and the same set of principles and perspective, no matter the subject. My roots are in documentary photography, but what I do now incorporates elements that we might think of as street photography, but it's more about kind of observing life. I have a certain set of things that have trained myself to be aware of as I'm out making pictures. Noticing the light, looking for interesting backgrounds, anticipating certain movements, observing foreground to background so that when the time comes to actually make the picture i'm not overthinking i'm open to that moment happening to that magic happening in the frame 
Some helpful tools for adding color and intrigue to the image can be playing with props or an object that can create shadows or reflections or things that can be put in front of the lens to create shapes that help define the subject, can obscure parts of the image that might be distracting, and can add an overall shape to the image that might help bring out the subject, add another layer of contour and depth to it. So I like playing around with different things that could be as simple as the keys in my pocket. Bottles could be anything. That's the fun part. Experiment and see what you can do with the found elements and create things that help you obstruct the lens. I play with a lot of the in-camera tools that help shape the image and add a little bit more of my character, my color palette, the contrast that I want to have. Helping certain elements of the frame disappear with a shadow, warming up something to bring out the reds and the hues and that kind of thing. The tools that you find in camera can be very useful and actually quite fun to experiment with. What I'm looking for when I'm photographing a subject, yes, there's the color and the light and the shadow and the angle, but I want to feel something when I see an image. I want to react to it. I want to connect with it. The way to get to that is having this tool that's accessible and not getting too bogged down in the idea of the perfect composition and all of the tools that may be available, but simplifying, observing, noticing very basic things of background and foreground, and then looking for that thing that connects you to the subject. Oh, Susan, many of the photographs were taken with iPhone, as you see. With an iPhone, yeah. <laughs> yes, I know, I know. I hope you, you're enjoying these uh, short videos that I, that I look for because I think they always bring very interesting topics um, and lessons in connected with what we're doing. So um, let's go quickly because uh, time flies. Does anybody need to leave the class earlier? Or are we okay? Everybody's okay? Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, I just want to make sure. Sorry, I know when I when I designed this class, I said 45 minutes, but it's, it's almost impossible, especially uh, as many of you, and, and I want to do it properly. So I don't remember who sent this, uh, this selection, uh, uh, Janet. Uh, so tell us why this, this is, remember, if anybody does not remember, I hope all you, you remember is, I said, look at uh, um, Paolo Pellegrini's work, most of it in black and white, and Alex Webb, mostly in color, and choose uh, two images, one from each, and tell us why. Why this photograph, Janet? Why from all of his work you chose this? I can almost smell the dust. <laughs> Okay. And, and the foreboding clouds add a tre tremendous sense of mystery. And the people in the middle, I've been on sheep drives, so I'm very aware that it can get really dusty and dirty. Uh, but I love the fact there's, there's just a lot of motion in the air, in the clouds, in the animals, and I just, I just love it. Very dramatic, right? Very dramatic. Uh, I like it too. What about uh, this one? You sent me two. What about yeah. this one? Well, I look at that as, as being very alone out there. Um, he's certainly in an area that doesn't have a speck of grass, to my, to my knowledge. So he looks very isolated. Okay. Okay. So... And uh, it's a your... voting area. It's, it's, it's very barren. Okay. A very interesting thing that Janet is uh, sharing is that her connection with Pellegrini is her response to emotion that is being triggered on herself and things that she can connect or she has experience. Right. So uh, Pellegrini is actually doing what we said about connecting with the human element on both sides of the frame, both in the photo and outside the photo, right? So things start falling into place. And what about this one, Janet? Why do you choose this, uh, this one from Alex Webb? I liked the creativity in that picture. I liked the fact that his hand is very, very uh, reflected, both sides. He, they pick up the, the fact that it is a mirror. And, uh, and then the, uh, the, the fellows looking curiously at this guy coming toward them, and they've got guns. 
So it's kind of an interesting perspective. And then plus uh, the uh, lone shack with, that's reflected in the, in the frame. Yes, uh, I like it too. Um, Dirk, uh, answering the question you, you asked me the other day, is this well composed? This should be wider, like the image from your daughter. I don't know, right? From, from a technical point of view, in terms of perfection, I can see a bag on the upper portion. I can see the feet. I can see some blue things on the back. But it does not matter at all because there are other elements that they have become relevant and they have taken over. And that's what I was trying to, to tell you earlier with your photograph of, the, uh, of your daughter playing with, with the balls in, in the bathtub, in the plastic pool. Uh, it doesn't matter that the swimsuit is on the floor because there's a subject matter that has taken over the scene and I don't see it anymore. It's, it's when, you, when you like someone and you don't see the mistakes anymore because they disappear. Uh, so it's the same thing with photography. Once they capture and they grab your soul, boom, the rest is, is no needed. And that's why I said uh, when I started and when I was uh, becoming slowly more professional, I was told, relax your composition, open up, and your images will be, become much more stronger. And that's the first thing that I told most of you with when I started this class, do so, and then your images will become alive. What about this one? This was sent by whom? Janet too, or? Yes. I, okay, I, why, why this one, Janet? The desperation in the fellow that's trying to go over the wall. That's, that's okay. quite, quite a shadow there. Uh, it, it's very graphic. Uh, I like the shadows, the harsh shadows in there. Uh, but it shows a sense of desperation. And, yes. Uh, and I, I like I like the the buildings because that's pretty much the way it looks. I like it too. Uh, there's two other things that I like a lot. Uh, the the uh, the painting. I love the painting. I mean the, the color. You see this this pastel color. I also love the the cross, the falling cross on the background. Mm, yeah. Uh, so I like the wire. With, I like this, yeah. this sort of a wire. It looks like a telephone wire or something hooked up. That, that has exactly the same color, or it looks like, that is almost pinky orangey right. uh, or, or reddish uh, uh -huh. as the building, as, as the rest. So it comes together. What about this one? I don't know who sent this one. I did. Um, okay. I like that this is an illusion. You really had to think about how he got this shot. And it was in a succession... Um, I believe that he took at a pool. So from underneath, these are people jumping off a diving board. But obviously at first, you it just made me wonder immediately, like how is this a, a body of water and they're laying in it with the reflection or how did he capture it? Um, but I think it really pushes creativity. I love, love, love silhouette shots. I love the contrast of the light on the cloud and even the contrast of the guy that has no cloud behind him. It's just a really, really interesting shot. Using beautiful, be too. beautiful composition. Some of these photographs, they're taken with like a 35 probably. Mm. Uh, uh, like many of, of the, uh, the storytellers today, like Cartier-Bresson, well, it depends on styles, but they're taken with fixed lenses, normal lenses, semi-wide, uh, but no distortion. What about this one? Wow. Yes, I submit yes. this one too. Um, I really, there's so many things about this that I love, but I really love the tones. I love the movement. You can see people kind of all the way in the top corner coming all the way across to the bottom. And all of them are just doing, they're just, it's a really good snapshot of life. You know, some people are bathing themselves. There's, you know, the mom holding her child, people having conversations. It's just like, it feels like you're standing right there. And I really like the perspective and the movement of the water and how the greens and the browns and the white are just, it's just a really beautiful capture. Um, I'm really happy to hear your comments and Janet's comments and probably all of your comments because you're reacting to some of the things that I have been describing as being important in order to create photographs that they last. Okay, what about this one? Who sent this one? I did. Okay, Hub. Yes. So this is the photographer's daughter. I, 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 um, in both of the photographers that we looked at, I was especially interested in looking 
for pictures of, of girls or women um, that weren't uh, sex objects. And in this case, we saw mostly his daughter. And I think it's because the series I was looking at was they, they were in, uh, in, in so social isolation. Um, and so, uh, you know, she's, she, she, I, uh, I love that she's a little bit blurred, that she's got all of this, um, this fog or cloud cover behind her, um, out for a walk, probably uh, may not be able to go very far while they're in, while they're in lockdown. Um, the light on her face. Yes. Um, you can see that there's just there's just layers of uh, layers of mood to this photo that I like. I, I like it a lot too. And also, let me remark again: another normal lens, probably no distortion. One of these lenses you don't use, Hub. But I'm telling you, you, you get one. I said I don't usually use it. I, no, no, I'm just saying that's why yeah. I'm telling you. Like, yeah. I want you to start using it. And yeah, the other yeah. thing that, that makes me, uh, that I like about this photograph, uh, and this is, so, is, is getting into many details that may, maybe make no sense, but this is more connected with what some of the things that Janet was describing. If you notice the, uh, the, the vegetation that is on the background or whatever is on the background, it resembles the hair. The hair that is crossing the face mm -hmm. has the same shape and the same structure that one you have on the right-hand side. Oh, so it, yeah, it's yeah, almost... Right. Mm -hmm. It's almost ma Mother Nature uh, yeah. recreating the same thing. When we saw that photograph of, um, uh -huh. who was that? Uh, Cartier-Bresson, of that uh, of the person walking with, with the little kid and the background had the, uh, the, big, uh, the big sign that looked with the same trench coat. This is the same, but with nature. It's, yeah. We can find an association. So this is maybe yeah. my imagination, but I'm just... No, that, I'm just that's lovely. I like that. Um, yes, Harry. Uh, what about this one, uh, Hub? Uh, same thing. I was I was looking for uh, for a portrait that include included uh, the story of women and girls. Um, I like uh, I like the use of. I guess they're inside. I guess that's inside a car, uh, or inside some kind of building. I'm not sure, but I like how it's dissected the photo into. Yes, it's um, from the it's from the it's from the car. Uh, it's like a frame within the frame, but instead yeah. of the frame being on the outer layer, it has created yeah. a diagonal. And right. again, another example of a loose composition in a way, yeah. but actually it's absolutely perfect because yes. if you think about it, the girl on the left is creating a triangle and mm -hmm. she's actually placed within a triangle. Right. Uh, so she right. has created triangle, triangle, and then yeah. the other scene that has the movement. So it's like a... Uh, like an unfolded thing that our imagination can see both, plus yes. uh, the color. You have the, the reddish yeah. that is ma matching the soil. Yes. Um, I, I think there's somebody there that is doing something or typing, and we can hear, all of us, we can hear. So uh, if you can mute, because I can hear it click, 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 or, or, the, or the noise. Sorry to mention, but it's, it's a little distracting. I don't know if I'm the only Sorry. one hearing. Oh, no, might no, no, no. Might be me. Uh, and, the, and I also like the focus that, that the, the girl on the far left is so well in focus and the, yes. and the ones on the right aren't. Um, so in order to do this with the phone, you have to lock focus because if you right. randomly do right. it, who knows right. where the focus is going to finish? Maybe on right. the fore, fore part of, of the... Uh, uh, but it's pastel colors again. It has, it has like a painty look, right? Yeah. It looks like a painting, like the other one that Janet had chosen. It does, um, yeah. This is a photograph that was uh, sent by Patricia, and this is an example uh, that I don't see very clear, but she has applied that technique. So without overexposing, right, everything, all the subjects will be pitch black because they have a very bright background and a very dark foreground. A very bright background and very dark foreground. So the only way to capture this is basically uh, look at my focal point, lock on it, and then over uh, overexpose, and that's how you can get this photograph. And I'm glad that uh, Patricia applied this. Um, some uh, random quick photographs that they were sent by Janet. The reason that I, I chose them because now her photographs are in focus, and that's fantastic. So <laughs> she's been applying some of the things that we said. Be beautiful colors, beautiful selection. 
I like the art that you display at home. I saw some of the images, uh, but I'm glad that you start being aware that some of them were out of focus. You mentioned that you were using the, the trigger to shoot. So that experimentation is, is, is the, the beginning of the process that images are becoming better and better and better. So I'm very happy, very happy to see that. Uh, same thing here. Uh, the iPhone allow us to get very close to the subject, the details. I have a comment regarding this photograph. I don't need to see the wall. I don't need to see the upper furniture or whatever it's on the upper corner. You can fool me by cropping and showing me the butterfly, the, the material, maybe the surface that is under. And that's artistic enough. But if you're producing images that they're artistic, you have to care for details because that's how you show um, your viewers that you appreciate art, but also you can craft it. So that's my only observation. But I'm glad that they're, that they're much better in focus and that you're practicing and you're sending me stuff. So it makes me very happy. And then you sent me this one too, that I thought it was very, very original. Uh, uh, applying the same technique, that's uh, backlit. I can see through the uh, the leaf, and it's a, a beautiful image that makes me wonder. So I want you guys to start experimenting with these things. Uh, Dirk, you sent me uh, two photographs, I believe, uh, where you mentioned that you will have photographed them before. This is one. Why? Why is that? Well, because uh, on this one, it's definitely too dark. No, there's no. Uh... There's no light on the on the main object, which is the two girls, like my daughter and a friend, up on the up on the post. So, and I remember because I I don't think I sent that. I have another picture, a little bit at a different time of the day when it was brighter, and there's a, basically the opposite. It's like it's it's too much, it's too much. And so I didn't I didn't know about I knew about a little bit about changing the light, but I was not about the, like the focusing. And so that's. It's not taken. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it's taken with it's taken with the iPhone as well. But I was not just an okay. example. Okay. Either 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 way, I'm I'm glad that you that you noticed that. Uh, you also sent us as an example. I I assume it's for the same reason. Is that correct? Wow. Yeah. Exactly. That 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 one. I actually like that photo a lot. And that that's not taken with an iPhone. But um, that I know. That's like that's. And that was taken with one where I was playing with the, the opening time and the shutter speed and all that, but on a digital camera. And I didn't, I have like a series of, I think, 10. And that is the best yeah. one, but I'm still not so, I think I, there, there could, could be obviously now with new knowledge um, and a better camera because that one's not yeah. good. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, I, I and I'm going to tell you done a, it better. A, a quick trick. So I like the photograph because it has mood, right? Technically, it's missing a little bit, even though it has lots of character and it's very beautiful, right? Uh, you, could, you could use some of the techniques that we have described to make it happen, but what are you missing here? You're missing your wife or your daughter holding a reflector or a piece of mm. board and bouncing back some light that you see on the floor, bouncing back to the neck area, and suddenly the image becomes alive. Well, that, so, that, that was at a real expedition in the jungle, so we wouldn't have stuff like that. <laughs> no, 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 but no, 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 no. I, I remember I, I, I live in Panama for four years, so I, I, I walk those trails all the time. No, no, that, that, uh, is, that is on Coiba. You wouldn't have been there. That's like really expedition. That's like I've been in out. Coiba. I've been in, I've been in Coiba. <laughs> okay. I've been in Coiba too. No, but what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is that uh, what I do, and this applies to the phone too, you can bring a small uh, reflector, you can fold it, you can put it in the, in the backpack, super inexpensive. I can send you links or you can just look for it and you can bounce light. But sometimes they don't need to be things you, you buy. It can be a piece of, uh, I don't know, somebody has like a, like a metal thing on the backpack and you can just reflect some light and it creates sure. an effect like they, they, were, they were doing. So um, yeah, that's, this is just a, a suggestion and a, a little trick. And there's two things you can create with these type of images. Uh, you can show me the environment and the interaction of the subject with the environment, which is wider. Or you can bring me closer, right, with a normal lens. Or you can even bring me even closer and show me details. So you can do uh, the three things. Because the type of forest and the ecosystem, and I know, and, and I walk there too, uh, a wide angle lens closer to the subject tends to work best in my opinion, okay? 
Uh, and then you sent me this one that you said uh, you will have taken it differently. This one I like a lot, so I don't know what would you have done different. What, what, what would be your, how would you redo this photo? I don't know. I'm, I'm glad you say you like it. I actually like that a lot as well. But um, whenever I, I had options with my wife to print some things, she was always like she wouldn't like that too much. And the thing was always that it's like, I mean, I, as you can see, I tried to hide the sun right behind that uh, the post, yes. you know. So but yes. it's still it's still a little bit over over bright. There was no way to I, dim it down a little bit, no. So your, your like wife, your wife is your huh? wife is correct. The photographs. <laughs> or your the photograph is overexposed yeah. but again technically it's not perfect but it creates an emotion and it creates a mm. feeling so this is when these type of photographs they fall into a category if you like it print it somebody can <laughs> can say can say well this is not technically perfect so the answer is so what yeah, uh, but the wife decide what decide what goes on the wall. No, no, I'm not talking about your wife. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about recording about your wife. I'm just saying that yeah. sometimes you know, like things can be technically perfect and very boring, and they can be technically imperfect and they can be fantastic. So graphically, mm. it's a very interesting image and makes me and probably the rest of your classmates wonder about the shapes, the line, the sun. True, if you print this in a book, half of the photograph has no information. That is true. I'm not going to lie to you. It's white. It's overexposed. Mm. You could have sure. done the same photograph better, but still. Yeah, you can, you can nice see photo. on the left, on the left, you see the water correctly. Still, yeah, and then yeah. it just and fades the out, is, you know. The rest is, is white, washed out. Yes. So let's continue this. You sent me this to uh, this photograph. I, I, I assume this was for selecting focus, right? Uh, yeah, that's exactly. why this was, was Selected and uh, what about this one? Why this one was sent? That was for the project. Okay, 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 okay. But the, that was uh, the first. The can you tell us a little bit about uh, this image? Why do you chose this one in particular? Can, can you elaborate a little bit? Well, it was actually I was remember the the the, the purpose of the project is like I to remember. document a little bit um, and uh, obviously on Monday I didn't have the chance yet to do a picture because. The kids, although I'm allowed to leave at five in the morning to seven at night, the kids are only allowed to leave from four to seven. So I took her to the park right after we finished the class. I actually mm -hmm. went back to the apartment to get the iPhone because usually I don't take it. So I'm not distracted by messages. Mm -hmm. But then I was like, I don't know, I was trying to pay more attention to her. So it's not, uh, I cropped that as well. I'm sure it's not, it's not properly pro uh, proportions um because the picture is not the best but i think this one is okay because it shows her i think with the mask on which makes me pretty sad to see the girl with the mask on and but you still have the the tree a little yeah. bit in the as, as yes. the tree and the building and a little bit the sunlight the dim sunlight in the back and i also cropped off i think the a little okay. bit of, i think the so no, i have I, don't know. I, ha I, ha I have a comment because we have to be wrapping up uh because i can be here forever being a sure. Spaniard. Something for you guys to remember, right? Dirk and the rest of the class, you don't crop on your computer. You walk and you dance and you create compositions on the scene. If you want to become photographers, you have to practice what I mentioned about compositional dance, right? All that cropping that Dirk is describing that I remove this, I remove that, I encourage you and I suggest you do it in camera because you will become much more efficient. You will become better photographers and you will spend less time with the computer and more time out there and enjoying. So all those crops that you send me, because I know they've been cropped, try to do them in camera and you see that your photographs will become much more better. It's hard at the beginning. Uh, and also we, we fall into a, a lazy um, stage. That we say, ah, I can do that. Ah, I can do that. I can crop that. I never do that, okay? So I want you to start doing the same and it will be very beneficial for all of you. This was sent by, I don't remember. Um, Hop, okay, yes. I, I know somehow I'm missing photographs from some of you. I know Susan, uh, I think Patricia didn't send me just those animal shots. Uh, if, if I made a mistake, you can send them to me and I'll review the next day. But Really quickly, Hub, talk about these photographs that I, I liked a lot, your selection. 
Talk about this I was, Quick, I was, quickly. I was messing around with focus, and and uh, I would. This was a this was a little a little uh, koi pond, and I liked the shadow of the of the uh, the um, lily next to the next to the uh, leaves. But then I noticed the I started noticing the puddles on the leaves, and yeah. there was actually something in there. I can't really tell what it is, but there was something in there that was swimming in that puddle. Okay. Wow. Um, and so there was movement in the puddle when there wasn't movement anywhere else. So I, I just, I just liked it. I liked how it, it uh, reflected the light. Okay. I like, uh, I liked. And it, and it works because how about I, I think you like the color blue, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's about, uh, it's about uh, shapes and it's about color. Mm -hmm. uh, and she's chosen to live. 50% uh, of the whole uh, canvas blue, the rest is green, yeah. busy, and then very empty and attached on the right. So it works and it delivers a message. What about this one? So this one I was practicing focusing on, on near close. So I yeah. focus, I set the focus on the plant. Um, and these cameras are so remarkable. You know, everything really is in focus. But, yeah, they are. Uh, but I wanted to, I wanted to experiment with... I tried very, lots of different angles to see uh, what I could what I could get for um, focusing in different places. I tried to focus on the lighthouse too, yes. uh, but it's too far away. It really didn't it really didn't enhance the photo to do that, and you yes. you get enough of an impression. So that is I, correct. So I like, uh, yeah, sorry, sorry, Fab. Yes, Finn. No, no. So I just like being able to to get a a real kind of visceral sense of the leaves of the plant right in front of us. Yeah, so the, sorry that I was interrupting, but what I was trying to tell you is that applying what we mentioned regarding the lens of choice is how you can you can play with that uh, depth of field and the subject. So uh -huh. it's not only the aperture, but it's also the lens and the distance. So if you photograph with a normal lens with a telephoto lens, it has an impact. If I photograph with a wide-angle lens, very, very close to those leaves with very shallow depth of field, boom, the rest suddenly vanishes, okay? Uh, really quickly about this one. Tell us about uh, this one really quickly. Again, I was using the spot focus so that I would put the subject, the human subject, in focus and and not nothing else. So experimenting with that homework. Yes, that the looks like only the most enormous. What? Albatross, that albatross looks huge. I know. Yeah, they, that is the biggest. That's the biggest chick this year. That one is really chubby. Uh, <laughs> we call it Mamona. <laughs> you know how is you you're making me want to go to Hawaii. It's not going to well, happen yeah, in, the, in, the, in the next short term, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of easy. This, to is, the, this is the double uh, product, of, the byproduct of seeing this yeah. photograph. But you better get an I'm assignment glad, here. I'm, I'm I'm glad that you're experimenting with with these ideas. Also, be aware that when you photograph under these uh, light uh, environments, right? Uh, if you're under a shade right or there's branches and there's bright light and low lights it creates a situation for the camera that is very complex to read so yes, yes. If you if you want to be better photograph earlier in the day like super super earlier or later yeah. in the day so everything is even and more uh yes, more, more even okay. yeah this hasn't been i know possible. you know but yeah yeah i understand uh mm -hmm. this one I, I this one i thought it was very interesting uh um I, I, I like the fact that some of half of the photograph is almost in darkness. The other one has a bright light. The subject is placed on the crossing. Then it's very graphic with the palm trees. Uh, it would have been fantastic to have like a human figure somewhere, like yeah. a, a silhouette type of thing. Yeah. Uh, but they're very graphic images and they're, they're, they're well put together. And I love uh, the selection that, that, that you sent. Um, then you send us this photograph <laughs> of Susan. Surprise, and you Susan. Said, <laughs> and then it makes me think that you know each other, right? No, we don't. And then, and then, and then you and then you said, uh, "Beautiful, perfect subject, but uh, wrong, wrong doing." Wait, you asked us to send a picture. You asked us to send a picture that was the disaster. So yes. I sent a picture of a of a lovely evening with a lovely person, um, but yes. it's hugely backlit and and uh, not too not too focused. So. The food okay. is the I guess that shows you what I was looking at. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad that you noticed these, these things. Also, um, I have a, the only thing that I have a problem with in this photograph is the, the background 
behind yeah. her shoulders that's really distracting yeah. so i i could cope with the uh with the composition that is tilted the background yeah. on the left but then my attention goes there and it's yeah. very bright so that's yeah. a no no that's for, the uh, for you right. yes yeah. So this is this is for today. Uh, wow! Well, uh, every day I think it's the quarantine. Every day I talk more and more and more. Like if I keep on teaching this class, they will be like twenty-four hour classes or something. Uh -huh. So uh, the the assignment um, for the next day, and please, 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 do them. I know you're busy. I know you're, but these are for you. These are your opportunity to to learn, practice, and make mistakes. I want to photograph five images of someone in an attempt to show us who they are. So this is a, a portrait exercise, a portrait assignment. I'm not telling you that the person needs to be in every single photograph. I want you to be creative. I have given you lots of hints on how, or how to do it. Um, and the second one is that not all images, they should be conventional photographs. Think outside the box, incorporate objects and elements to help you tell the story. And if you happen to be alone and you don't have access to somebody that you could photograph, then the subject is going to be yourself. Okay. And then I have one more. Uh, so the person that cannot photograph somebody has automatically saved one assignment because the other one is that I want you to take two pictures of yourself. I want to take you to take a selfie and another photograph that tell us who you are. So, uh, a combination of two images that I'm going to place one next to each other. Hopefully uh, you can make them both vertical so we can place them on the screen at the same time. And they will tell us who is Janet, who is Dirk, Alex, um, and that's that's the assignment. So I hope you enjoy the class. Um, I, I really mean? did. I think uh, I think. Hey, what do you mean very... a selfie and another photo? What is what is it? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Aren't Sorry, my, sec my, my second language here. So you're right. So another photo, I mean, one is, is going to be a photograph of yourself, right? Yes, yes. Uh, and another photo that is going to complement that selfie to give me information about yourself. Uh, so I'm not going to tell you how to do it. So there's two images that are going to tell me who you are. So Does that one, make sense? One is a selfie and one is something else. And, uh, and the other one can be whatever you want it to be. I'm not putting you any constraints, any limitations. Uh, I have some ideas of what you guys could do, but I don't want to tell them. I don't want to tell you what to do. That's, that's normally how I like doing things. So I hope you enjoy the class. I certainly did. Uh, and uh, I hope you learned something interesting today. And uh, any questions, feel free to ask me anytime. I'll be around. Okay.